Good morning, everybody. Oh, good morning, and welcome to day two of the Equity Summit 2018, our power, our future, our nation. What, oh yes, oh my goodness. What an exciting day we had yesterday. I must tell you, the panel that I moderated in the morning just set the tone for the day. As I was sitting there talking to those magnificent people, I said, oh, they are really bringing it. We are really gonna have all those conversations that we're never quite sure we wanna have. And then I got to go to a couple of the other sessions and the conversations that people are having, the way the audience is leaning in to make sure that you get every word, the questions that you're sending up on the apps. I just am so impressed with what it means to be able to come together like this at a crucial moment and be with your colleagues and with colleagues that you don't know, but you know share all of your commitment to change, to spend time together learning and growing and making commitments and building the movement we all need to get to the place where we wanna be. Yesterday was amazing. And I said yesterday that our big plenaries were gonna be about our things, our power, our future, our nation. We focused on our power yesterday, we're gonna focus on our future this morning, and we're gonna focus on how to have the solidarity we need to be the stewards for the nation, which we talked about yesterday. So here we go again, and I'm just thrilled. There is a couple of announcements that I want to make. One is, again, Manuel Pastor and the book, uh, State of Resistance. He will be signing the book today between 11.45 and 12.15 in the Radisson Blue at the pop-up bookstore. I hope you will stop by and get your signed copy. I also want you to really take part in the interactive art that is here. In the Monroe boardroom, there is an exhibit called Stolen Lives, and it was made available to us from the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis. It is an opportunity for us to really have to think about gun violence. And what you will see is an exhibit that already starts you off thinking about what has happened across this country in terms of gun violence, and particularly some of the lives that have been lost through what's happened with interaction between police and young black men in this country. And I know that many of you know others who have been killed. And this is an opportunity for you to see them, to call out their names, to put their names on the exhibit and know that the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis will be taking all of our contributions back to that exhibit. So stop by. And while you're there, go across the hall and see the exhibit that's been put up by the UCLA Labor Centers that documents the lives of dreamers. It's called Undocumented Stories, a powerful exhibit. So make sure you take advantage of all of those things. Today, I am, it is my pleasure to introduce Robert Rapahi, who is a native storyteller, singer, drummer and performer to be able to get us started in the right way on this important morning. Thank you all, I'll look, see you later in the day. Thank you. All right, here it goes. Oh, you can hear me already, huh? Oh, geez. Whoa, you see make noise. Oh, uh, Mitakiyapi. In the Dakota language, that means, um, how are you? Greetings, all my relate, my relatives and relations. I, uh, geez, I'm still getting used to this contraption. Uh, uncles, my uncle, one of them would tell me many times, begin with something humorous, make friends right away. I, uh, so I was thinking on the way here, which I don't do very often, is uh, I should bring, yeah, I was going to bring a pile of paper and set it on the, well, it's not here, so that took care of that, the uh, whatever you call that thing, and then grab the first sheet and begin to read and just look out and see how many people were going, oh, no, how long is he going to take? Man. But then I had a, lucky for you, I decided to grab that and toss it. So that would have made a nice little visual there. Um, 
I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, but there won't be no test later, so don't worry about it. Um, how many of you here are artists? Pretty cool. Um, and just I asked the same question of all age grammar kids in different parts of the Chicago public school system, and they get roughly the same uh, equivalent. A few hands will go up. Some will go right, right away. How many of you can write your name? That makes you all artists. <laughs> Same process. You have an idea. Transmits to a muscle or something. To something to implement. Something to put it on. And create an idea. Write an idea. Put a note of music. Uh, so there's a connector of all of us. We're all artists. We just don't think about it in that way. Um, how many of you drink water? All hands should be up, right? <laughs> pretty sure. Oh, that's pretty bright light. Um, there's another connector. Everything, I started out as a musician. Let me start this way. I stumbled into the visual arts purely by accident, but I noticed that for me, I began learning things because I just, I didn't go to school or anything. I was going to take no time to go to school. I um, began drawing. I was living in New York City at the time. And I was thinking, well, first I asked somebody, well, how much do models charge? And back in the 70s, it was probably $60, $70 an hour. But then I, oh, I looked out the window and noticed there's 8 million people walking around here for free. And they're sitting there in the park. They're doing stuff. They're, so I decided that this was a lot easier to carry pen, paper, than a piano. I originally began as a pianist. I had every intention of being the next Earl Garner, but that lot of good that done. Um, so I've been mostly a visual person all my life, but the first time it's actually become my drug of choice. And through it, I found other connections amongst us. Well, we all have roughly the same figures, a couple of arms, most of us. Some swim a lot, some run a lot. I used to run a lot. As a young person, I climbed trees all my life. Oh, my, well, I climbed a tree about three days ago. And it's not easy to do in Illinois or Chicago because it's against the law to climb a tree here in the city. Um, but my thoughts when I saw your sign, and the first word I noticed was the equity part. So I kind of thought, well, this is some kind of real estate place here. I'm in the wrong building. <laughs> then it, then it, I equated it with the actual root word, equal. And in that, in the arts, I found out we're all equal. We have a flag, our, the tribal, many of the tribal people have a flag, which is actually strips of colors, red, yellow, black, white. And then there's also the additive colors of blue for the sky, green for the earth. And it was a couple of years into my um, artistic career that it dawned on me that these colors are all the colors that I use to make complexions of people, whether it's light skin, dark skin, whatever, however you want to describe skin as. Um, and there was another connector. So I was always um, cognizant. Oh, I'll tell you a real quick one. A marble. When I was playing basketball in my good days, coach gave us marbles. Keep them in your mouth. It'll always keep you, uh, your mouth will salivate so you won't get thirsty. So while the other team was running up and we were all running up and down playing ball, playing defense and doing stuff like that. Uh, we noticed that their team would go to the side, gulp a lot of water, and start cramping up. Coach told us about the stone. Sacred stones to our people have been around for thousands of years in our belief system, and they're just left over from the glacial period. Uh, but there were a lot of them that used to be lying around. And he asked me a while ago, he heard a click, then it dawned on me, oh, oops, the marble. 
Uh, I'm not sure how much, what's the right word here? Not, I can't say or should say. It's sort of like trying to sit up here and explain in five, six minutes, 10,000 years of experience. Some are actual family stories of why skunks have two stripes, um, why things look the way they do, why trees lose their leaves in the winter and I can't see a tree nowhere in sight here. This is really uh, hmm, not working out the way I thought. Well, and it all stems from being connected. I've lived in all parts of the world was sent there on purpose to Vietnam against my better will and judgment. And I noticed, again, visual things in that, where is she at? I gotta keep checking my prompter here. Cause I'll sit here and go off on you and you all say, ah, oh, you wonder what that look again. Oh. Um, well, anyway, I went around and saw all the different people of the world in New York City, again, we were talking about it early. It sounded like a New York convention we were having there for a while, of a campaign for the, the Big Apple. In that, in New York City, I met all the people of the world within a two block radius. You can't do that in Chicago very well, but in New York, you can. And I loved that place. It was part of the thing that helped show how connected we all were, because we all did roughly the same one we were, to got up in the morning, complained about things, and they were connected. And I lived in all the neighborhoods. I lived in Harlem on 106th Street in Amsterdam, as we could the name of it was, if they haven't changed it by now. Even in the neighborhood I lived in for the most of my time up there uh, was called Hell's Kitchen. But the mayor didn't like that, so he tried to name it after a president. I forgot which one, but somebody. And Again, I always notice the connectedness and the quality about your logo there. And there's no real good way of explaining it. I'm doing a play right now somewhere in Chicago that has to do with racism strictly in Chicago. And I don't know why they asked me. I haven't been, I came here to stay two weeks, 30 years ago. <laughs> I'm having trouble finding the exit. Um, but I've become involved with all the nationalities of all the cultures while living in New York, playing Latin music, going. <laughs> Learning how to speak Spanish again, purely by accident, had no intention of being Spanish, <laughs> uh, had every intention of being Dakota all my life. Uh, so I had been intermingling with everyone and never actually encountered racism. The closest thing I got to encountering racism or discrimination is when I'm riding on a train or on some vehicle or I'm sitting in a seat and all they see is this and someone will, Madam, can you move a minute? I think it was kind of humorous. My grandkids wanted to fight somebody, but they were grandkids for you. This thing's moving. Can I still see it? I did move, right? It's still there, all right? Because yeah, I can still hear the echo. Um, a fella once told me about, or not even tell me personally, but I was listening to one of his talks and he mentioned that one of his visions was about this little blue dot in the vastness of space that we all share. And maybe he was the first one, his name was uh, Carl Sagan. And I loved his book, Broke His Brain. Wow, I read that thing four times. Um, he was another one that inspired me about the connectedness of all, all the people. And I, can't, I don't know, how, I know what the right word I could ever say. Our language, our highest, value for my people, the Dakota, well, probably for all people, but honestly, is the ability to speak and be, understand um, without too much difficulty. And 
it was prized. The word, when you hear chief mentioned with tribal people, you kind of get a, especially with grandmothers. Grandmothers are real good about it. They don't say much, but they'll give you a look. Come like that. And what they said about you, either leave the room or I'm gonna choke you or something. Let me see you for a couple of days. Um, but language was highly esteemed. Um, our actual words for whenever other people would come to meet us, well, that person speaks for us. And it could be a man, could be a woman, a woman. Uh, women had equal rights way before it was picked up here by the, the newer people that showed up. And it was kind of interesting too, because we are many of my aunts and uncles would tell me that there were female speakers for the people. It wasn't just a men, men, uh, what was that? Male dominated cultures. Some others are, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm roaming around because I, again, I want to tell you so much and I've only got a few, where's the time card in? Where am I at here? Two minutes. All right. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> Lucky I don't sweat. I also don't have eyebrows, which my kids are always telling me about. Uh, I have a grandson right now. I swear he's got two great caterpillars around each one. Big. They're just not orange. Uh, but again, with the thing about equity, I've lived in all parts of the world, all parts of neighborhoods here in Chicago. I roam around. I've never been confronted uh, racially, uh, bigotedly. Is that right? I just made up a word. Huh? I might have. Uh, in that way, so when they were asking me to participate in a play, uh, they asked me about my racial uh, incidents. And the closest I could come was that in living in some neighborhoods, I've gone in there and people come up to me, me and a brother. Uh, I don't really know what you're saying there. And sometimes I'm mistaken for Middle Eastern, which is, I guess that's that thing there that does it too. And that's as close as I've ever experienced racism. I've lived in, I've lived on the west side of Chicago when I was always all Jewish here in 1961. I went to Marshall High School. We won a championship. We won two championships actually. Um, and I, encourage you, I commend you, all of you, for following the path that you are following and creating an equity and equality amongst the people in whatever fashion you do it, artistically, in all the three arts, the music, visually, or writing it down, um, and encourage you to continue in it. I, I stumbled on this a little late, but it has helped me to show all the nationalities, any neighborhood I go to, anybody can do this stuff. It ain't rocket science. Just a piece of paper, a mark, make a mark there, and it'll look like something if you turn it around long enough. Um, and there's another connector amongst us, because most of us have this, a brain. I use mine uh, sparingly, but I use it once in a while. Um, and I can pick up a marker. I don't have to go the old time way and start a fire, burn a branch, and start, oh, that bit probably blew his ears out and make a mark. We all have the ability, have the skill, if it's called a skill after a while. And well, I'd just like to thank you all for listening to an old guy, kind of reminisce and remember some of the dumb things I did in life that I didn't tell you about because I'm not going to. <laughs> I'm not going to say real dumb stuff I've done. But I do encourage you all to keep that word in mind, equity. Not the real estate part, just a, a part about we're all the same people. We're all breathing air. We all drink water. We all have thoughts, whether they're, whatever they are, they're thoughts. 
And they're all connected. We're connected whether we like it or not. Even when I tell somebody, all my relations, well, you ain't related to me, you ugly as heck, which is probably true. Uh, but we are still all related. We're all on that little blue marble in the vastness of space. Thank you again, Pilamaya. Good morning. Good morning. Some of you all still look really tired. <laughs> My name is Michael McAfee, and I'm president of PolicyLink, and I'm going to be moderating our, the, our future plenary. Today, we're going to be talking about really trying to find the, the edges of the equity movement. And before I turn and introduce this distinguished panel, I just really want to take a moment to share with you how PolicyLink, me and my role, is thinking about trying to find the edge especially trying to find the edge when the organization is still on the upswing in terms of its impact. And one of the most powerful things I've enjoyed about being on this transition journey with Angela is the gift of intergenerational leadership. Um, to be able to dream with her, learn from her, learn from others like Joe Brooks in the audience, Judith Bell and others, um, and then to think about how do you build on that legacy. So I'll share a couple of things that, that are emerging that I think are really important for PolicyLink to think about the leading edge of the equity movement. The first is for us to get clear about who we serve. We don't think it's enough to say people of color, low-income people. So we've gotten clearer about that. We know what our number is now. You heard me say it yesterday. Our number is the 100 million living at 200% of poverty in America. And the reason why that number is so important because it keeps us from getting seduced into doing things that organizations that sit at the level of policy link could easily get into seduced into thinking that it's, that's the work. Writing the reports, doing these convenings, building communities of practice, all of that stuff has its place. But if it isn't transforming lives, it is irrelevant and the institution is irrelevant. And so for us, the 100 million keeps us grounded, but it also challenges us to think about what do we have to let go of to have the transformative impact on that population. And when we're talking about transformative impact now, we're talking about at least serving 51% of that 100 million in any place that we're in. You can imagine the stress that that puts on an organization. Now here's the reality. That is good stress to have because that is the work. That's why we came to this work to change the world, not to satisfy and do small stuff. So for us, we're asking that question everywhere we go. Even if you want us to come in and do a workshop and build some capacity, we're questioning whether we should just do that. Because we want to know how much of that, if we're in Pittsburgh, if we're in Long Island, how many of the folks are we going to have the privilege of serving? That 100 million is grounded in a strong results framework that allows all of the staff to organize around it. 
building healthy communities of opportunity, building an equitable economy, and building a just and fair society. Now, those are big buckets of work that a lot of things can fall under, and that's fine. But what is more important is after you get under those big buckets of work, that you are clear about how you're going to measure progress. And so for us, the thing that matters for us is the indicator of how we're going to measure progress along the way. Not just to tell you the stories about what's happening generally in those big buckets. The results framework then has to be grounded in what you heard us talk about yesterday, radical imagination. It's no longer good enough for us to just keep thinking that we can draft off of Angela's leadership and her legacy. I often say that we have to now get our own, make our own shot. <laughs> We've got to be able to get our own shot as staff at PolicyLink, and that's what's so exciting is that that's what we're stepping into right now. So in many ways, yesterday was about the PolicyLink team stepping into our own power to figure out how will we build on the legacy of PolicyLink and all the benefits that have been inured to us because of Angela's legacy and figure out where do we take the organization. So there's some org areas that we could go in that are, are new and scary, but we've always done new and scary work. Some of those might be like things like getting into algorithmic equity. If algorithms are going to design everything that we touch, we should have a point of view about putting the marker down about what that design should look like. We should be thinking about market-based solutions to the mobility challenge that are grounded in equity. Mobility shouldn't just be a social service problem to solve. And we've got to be willing to wade into the private market and not losing sight of why we're wading into the private market. But to wave into that market and design products for the 100 million the same way people design products for us, those of us who have more resources. That's the opportunity. When I say that, sometimes people get scared and think, oh, Michael, you're going into capitalism. Well, that is the design of the nation. If you don't want to go there, you are missing a huge opportunity. The work for this moment is for us to redesign the nation, to redesign the economy, and to liberate the 100 million by bringing down these oppressive systems and structures that are hurting our people. So here's the reality. At PolicyLink, before we go into community telling other folks what they ought to do, we've got to continue to push ourselves to be a model of equity. Even though we look like the United Nations, it does not mean that we fully have mastered it. I need to continue to ask myself, where are we recruiting returning citizens? Where are we recruiting folks that went to state colleges? Where are we recruiting folks from native communities? That can't be a 20-year journey, because remember, we, we blame everybody else when they take 20-year journeys doing diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Think about your organization. It must model the future that we're talking about. Because what I know is, when you struggle to solve the problems yourself, you bring a new genius to it. It is no longer theoretical. So where we want to be is in the heat of the battle, figuring out how do we make policy link a model of equity inside first, to continue to push ourselves to get better at that. And then how do we let go of things that we might be really good at and get a lot of accolades for, but they no longer serve us for what this moment requires of us? That's tough. That is really tough for a legacy institution. But if we're going to stay relevant, that's what we have to do. The last thing I'll say here before I introduce the panel is this, you know, people often complain because folks are in the streets. And I find that fascinating, because folks wouldn't be in the street if those of us who ran institutions did our job. In many ways, I feel like the frustration in the nation is a direct reflection of what Greenleaf talks about, which is a crisis of institutional quality. Many of our organizations have ceased to really be able to serve. And so if there's one thing that I've got to be able to guard and move forward with my brothers and sisters at PolicyLink, it is to daily be focused on increasing the capacity of PolicyLink to serve. Not serve foundations, not serve you, serve the hundred million. 
That's our job, to be doggedly focused on that. And then to be respectful, but disruptive in everything that we do. Because if we're not, we're not going to design the future that we're talking about. And the future that I see, I saw on that dance floor last night. I saw black and brown joy reigning supreme. And let me tell you why that is so important. Jerry Hudson closed out yesterday in a powerful way. I say black and brown joy, and I'm not being exclusive. I'm saying black and brown joy because Jerry said something that I know is in my heart, which is actually to design a nation that works for all. And when those of us who have experienced the most pain get a chance to lead, we always lead with an open heart. And if we're not, we should be holding ourselves accountable. So this is what this future panel plenary is about. Us thinking about where do we go next. We've got a lot of ideas about where we go next at PolicyLink. I'll tell you one quick story, and I'm turning. As we've gone through this transition, there came a day where I needed to go over to Angela's. We were going through couples therapy. <laughs> and we, we had a culture. We were going over there, and I, I had all of these ideas about where I wanted to take PolicyLink. And one of my blind spots is when I really believe in something, I move to the advocacy position before I've tried to join with you. I'm ready to fight for it. So I'm like, Lord, I'm going to Angela's house, and this is going to be that first day. We really argue. And I'm tentative. I'm sitting on the floor, and she's sitting on the couch in the living room, and we're the, the, the therapist is asking us questions and things, and he turns to me and says, Michael, share what you want to do about the future. And so even my body language started sinking down. <laughs> <laughs> and I started sharing about all these possibilities and these places I wanted to go. And I could see Angela's back straighten up some of the things you heard about her last night. I could see her focus in on what I was saying, and I was like, Lord, she's getting ready to hit me with this. <laughs> <laughs> and when I finished, there was this the biggest smile on her face. And it was like the most powerful opportunity because I realized, one, I had joined with PolicyLink. I understood the organization. I understood its values. I understood its DNA. I knew how to respect where it's been. And I also could find my own voice and where it needed to go. And Angela was there to join me on that journey. And that was a powerful moment for me to be able to say, wow, Policy thing's going to be all right if the staff, if I, step up and do this work. So what I'm going to turn to now is an opportunity for you to hear from some folks who are stepping up, who are doing the work, who are creating, who have ideas and are creating the future. So let me just turn to them and introduce, introduce them to you quickly. We've got Charlene Crullers. Hi. Hey. National Director of BYP 100. She is shaping a more equitable future to mobilize young organizers in developing their capacity to use their power to create a more just world. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Yeah. We've got Tara Huska, National Campaigns Director for Honor the Earth. She is elevating Native American voices on a wide variety of issues and reminding us all of all that extractive behavior is not our future. Mm -hmm. We've got Ai Jin Poo, Director, National Dom Domestic Workers Alliance and co-director Caring Across Generations. She's a preeminent labor organizer that is tr transforming the long-term care system in the United States with a focus on the needs of aging Americans, people with disabilities, and their caregivers. Welcome. And then there is Rip Rapson, president and CEO of the Kresge Foundation, a leader that is transforming how philanthropy aggregates and deploys capital in order to advance an equity agenda that strengthens cities, accelerates the evolution of private markets to be more equity-centered. Thank you. <laughs> Lotha Reddy, senior vice president, diversity, inclusion, and impact at the Prudential Foundation. She's harnessing the power of capital markets to drive financial and social mobility by combining diversity strategies, impact investments, philanthropy, corporate contributions, and employee engagement, and bringing to bear all of Prudential's full business capabilities. Woo. 
Derek Johnson, CEO, NAACP. He's reshaping one of the nation's premier civil rights organizations to have greater impact in eliminating racial discrimination in America. You still got a lot of work to do, don't we, brother? <laughs> And Carmen Rojas, co-founder and CEO of the Workers Lab. And the Workers Lab and Carmen, they're disrupting how we think about work by bringing together entrepreneurs, organizers, technologists, and advocates to create scalable and self-sustaining solutions that improve conditions for working people. So thank you all for joining us. Mm -hmm. Now what I thought I would start with, since this is about the future, is for us to dream a little bit. So I've asked two of my colleagues to dream. We've won on equity 20 years into the future. And I wanted them just to share their vision of what winning on equity looks like. So I'm going to start with Tara, and then I'm going to move to Carmen. All right. First up. Good morning. <laughs> How is everyone feeling? I'm Bear Clan from Kuching First Nation. And it was wonderful to see the indigenous voice included first up. We always have to acknowledge what land we're on, right? Mm -hmm. So 20 years into the future, I mean, we're seeing this massive swell of change already happening with more women and more people of color running for office than any other time happening right now, right? I mean, that's incredible. Um, and even from our own communities, from Native American communities, which are so underrepresented in every aspect of society, more Native women than ever before are running for office all over this country. It's an amazing time. I want to see that change happen. Um, I also want to see the changes happen. This is something very simple that we can do even now. I have to acknowledge the fact that Nestle, Nestle we have to look at our own behavior, right? It's so critical that we do that. I mean, whether it's you know, our conferences, whether it's in our organizations, we have to monitor and change our own behavior. How we are as consumers can shape this narrative into something else. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I just came back, actually, last night from the UK, where I was meeting with the banking institutions funding fossil fuels, going directly to them, telling them about your company is, is allowing this to happen. This is not indirect. You are, you are responsible for what is happening to my people. You're responsible for, for continuing this conversation of climate change. You're responsible for continuing this conversation of extraction as the world is running out of water, right? Um, 20 years from now, that massive migration that's on its way will be further along. Right now, it's just Cape Town that's running out of water, but that is going to grow, right? It's going to continue, continue, continue to grow. And so within 20 years, I'm hoping we see not just the incremental changes that everyone keeps talking about, but the systems changes that we need to do in order to address climate change and try to at least protect what we have left. Um, 20 years from now, I want to see an inclusive society of you know, not allowing these situations of, I'm really sorry about your situation, but that's not really my problem. You know, Native people are so forgotten in the conversation of America. That is not acceptable. We're the original peoples of this land, and we should not be an afterthought. Our history didn't end. Um, he, he mentioned that he didn't have any racist experiences. I spent six months of my life in North Dakota fighting the Dakota Access Pipeline. I can tell you there, are, there is some severe racism out there against Native people, and it is systemic and structural. It is the Washington Redskins being the home team of, of, the, of, of the nation's capital. Mm -hmm. You know, that translates to me going into meetings with, with, on Capitol Hill and being told, well, I'm not really sure if we can fund your project for teen suicide because we're not really think, we don't really think that Native nations are sophisticated enough to run their own affairs. Mm -hmm. You know, it is this idea, this false narrative of America. I hope that in 20 years, we have actually changed our educational curriculum to acknowledge the fact that this country is built on slavery and genocide. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can do a lot in 20 years. I think the power of uh, grassroots organizing and the power of the people is really being acknowledged all over this country and around the world. It's incredible, and I, it's amazing also to see youth and impacted communities at the front of it. 
Thank you, Harry. Hey. Very nice. Powerful. What you got, Carmen? And the three things that I've been thinking a lot about um, are one, um, what would I imagine in 20 years that we'll have a set of benefits for being? Mm -hmm. um, that they, we won't have benefits tied to work or benefits tied to sort of your situational access to privilege, but we in this country, country will have benefits for being. And what that looks like is not needing to pay 50% of your income for rent. It means not going to see a doctor and being on the brink of bankruptcy as a result of that. It means that in 20 years, I believe, we can be in a place in this country where kids can go to school from K to college for free um, and be unburdened by what the debt that many of our young people are experiencing today. Um, so I've been sort of playing around from a worker organization's perspective of, of what it means to have benefits for just being. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to be in this country and be guaranteed a set of, a baseline set of benefits um, and services and an infrastructure, a social infrastructure that allows us to be our best. So that's my first thing. Um, my second thing is maybe a bit more provocative, but it's a move today um, to move away from trying to fight for the things that we can win to fighting for things that will change the real lives of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I often think about this from the place, again, at the workers lab where um, we often fight for concessions. We fight for within a set of parameters that have been created for us. So I think Jerry Hudson said this really, uh, it struck me so much that he said this yesterday about the fight for 15, that in most cities in this country, you can't live on $15 an hour. So why are we fighting for it? Yeah. Why aren't we fighting for more? Mm -hmm. And I wonder what it would look like actually to be audacious mm -hmm. and fight for a $33 an hour minimum wage mm -hmm. in the cities where our people live, or it's actual creating aperture and not um, setting people up for failure. Right? Because then we give people $15 an hour and they are still poor and expected to uh, cobble together an existence. I don't want to live in that world. Mm -hmm. I want to live in a world of abundance. I also want to live in a world where we are electing uh, officials that love us so much that they want us to realize our dreams, that they make it our work to do that. And I don't want to concede around that. So I am hoping that in 20 years we're in a place we've moved from um, fighting for what he will give us to fighting for what we deserve in this country, that we're actually making a fundamental shift um, away from the, these constraints that have been created for us. The third thing that I've been thinking about is um, I hope uh, and really believe that in 20 years that we'll have a better practice uh, of having a narrative that has tethered us together. Um, I hope that in 20 years, um, and I believe that this is truly possible, that we'll look at the restaurant worker, the home care worker, the teacher, um, the service worker in this country, and we'll look at them with the same eyes of reference and glory that we give to like the one person who gets a job at Google and the two immigrants who go to Harvard, um, that we will look at the people who are undergirding our economy with the same um, hope and joy because they are able to live lives of dignity, um, that we have actually created a, a narrative that allows us to define us for us and like the wholeness of our love for each other and not sort of a narrative that defines us against each other, which is really easy and something that we can slip into really quickly. And I believe that that's really possible. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very nice. So 
as you were, two were talking, I felt myself getting anxious. And I felt myself getting anxious because as you were talking, I, the word selfishness mm. kept coming to my mind. Not from you all, but what we've got to let go of mm. to get there. So I want to focus on trying to think about what wisdom do we need to bring into the future to help us, and then I'm going to move to the economy. And Rip, I heard you say something at the Independent Sectors Annual Conference that was, I thought was profound, and it stayed with me. So I want to just read it and then ask you to think about this statement in the context of how they've laid out the future. You said, and we stand for an abiding optimism about the perfectibility of the human spirit and the power of faith and grace, not for the dismal brew of a calculating and cruel cynicism placed in service of an unyielding pursuit of self-advancement. This statement is powerful and has remained with me. So this notion of unyielding self-advancement, how do you take what you were thinking about at that independent sector conference and situate it in the context of this 20-year vision? My first impulse is to give it to Tara and Carmen. <laughs> it, it probably would be the best solution. Um, <laughs> it's, um, I was really struck by Carmen's notion that, that the imperative is to fight for what will, in fact, change people's lives, mm -hmm. um, not for what can be to sort of dispensed through the usual channels. And I think I would tie that back, Michael, by, by saying that you know, in the world that we live in, I live in, in philanthropy, in Detroit, in a kind of a complex region that is sort of trying to reinvent itself, the only way we've been able to make progress is to convince people that that sort of self-absorption doesn't work. Mm -hmm. That when you kind of draw into these sort of hermetically sealed universes of regions against cities, privileged folks against less privileged folks, um, you end up kind of messing the entire system up. Mm -hmm. and I think if there is a, a lesson to be drawn from Detroit, for example, it's that when Detroit kind of got itself, began to get itself kind of back on track, and a huge way to go, but back on track, people began understanding that that was for the good of everyone. All of a sudden, it wasn't oppositional region versus city, white versus black. It was this sort of web of mutuality that Carmen talked about. And so I think one of the things that philanthropy can do, I hope we can do if we've got our wits about us, is to try to figure out what are those points of convergence where everyone benefits. Everyone benefits from wages that pay uh, a family's needs. Everyone benefits from a transit system that connects people who are um, far flung from um, from their jobs. I was thinking of the Nestle example. In Detroit, right now, we're having a conversation about water shutoffs. At the same time, the state of Michigan is granting Nestle a permit to extract 200, 300,000 gallons an hour out of Lake Michigan. I mean, there is no reason that that kind of selfishness needs to endure. There's lots of ways to bridge between those two realities, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think what we need is a series of increasingly intensive, consistent proof points that actual mutuality actually does work. And I think that's a huge good news story coming out of Detroit. I mean, again, we have so far to go in making sure that all of the city's residents are part of uh, an inclusive recovery. But we've begun sort of helping people understand that the better the city does, the better the region does. The better the neighborhoods do, the better the central district does, the better the central district does. I mean, it's this kind of very simple construct that you can actually get over this sort of this narrowness of self-interest and self-advancement by finding things that are mutually advantageous. Mm -hmm. And Rip, a follow-up question. Yeah. In light of the nation was designed to intentionally be oppressive, how do we find that mutuality? Because I often feel like people like mutuality as long as they're staying on top. Yep. yep. <laughs> so when you were talking, and, I, and, and this is how we do our work, so I'm very much in alignment with you, but I'm thinking about anti-blackness and how do you find mutuality with folks who never want to see themselves as part of us and, have, and, and systems have been designed and serve no benefit to them and to crush us. It, but it's happening, so I'm confused. That's why I'm looking for your wisdom. <laughs> yeah. 
as the old white guy who sits on $4 billion of assets. <laughs> 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 Don't hurt me, Rip. Don't, don't, me don't mess with the system. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> uh, I, mean, th I mean, I think that is the question yes. that's been raised. What, what, where are the stakes high enough mm -hmm. so it's worth the effort? I mean, why in heaven's name would a philanthropy like Kresge not try to go right at that issue? We have $4 billion of assets that we mm -hmm. can deploy. I don't want to deploy it at the margins. I want to kind of aim, take aim at some of the systems, some of the structures that over time begin to dismantle those obstacles to opportunity. And I'm sorry to be such, at such a rhetorical level, but I actually think you can sort of pick your points, and they become like mm -hmm. acupuncture mm -hmm. points, right? If you choose wisely, mm -hmm. it begins to radiate into systems. And if you, I think if you go kind of frontally against some of this stuff at the same time, you sort of go kind of from the center out on some of this stuff. You can actually make a real difference. And, you. Uh, but you got to name it first. You're absolutely right. You got to name it. And, but you, I think philanthropy has got to increasingly claim it. I have very little time, I must admit, for philanthropy that is not focused on exactly these issues. Why do we have large, privately endowed philanthropy to sort of perpetuate privilege and the status quo? That's right. Thank you. Thank you. So I welcome you all to jump in. You don't have to wait. Please do. Um, so I want to, I'm going to come to you in a moment about business. It's connected to this. Charlene, I wanted to get, you, get your response mm -hmm. to what you heard. And <laughs> I, this is a relatively young panel. And so I also want to get your insights about how, what, do you, what are your thoughts on leading intergenerationally to bring about this future? You know, first, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, and just the, so much of what you shared at the very beginning about transition, mm -hmm. about uh, going bigger and thinking bigger is what's on my mind consistently. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited for the next wave of leadership uh, in Policy Link. Thank you. thank you. And thank you to Angela for all of the things that you've done uh, to get us all in this room <laughs> year <laughs> after year. Uh, so wow. Uh, how to respond. I'm, I've, I've been over here writing so many notes, and you call BS on mutuality, and thank you for saying that, because uh, that's what I wrote down. Mutuality is BS, because... <laughs> I wrote it down because who is to determine, who sets the terms of what mutuality looks like? Because if it's the person who's holding the reins, and, and particularly a person, or a family, or a small group of people, who are making the determination of where that $4 billion goes, we're already set in the wrong direction. It's already a problem. Because where did that $4 billion come from in the first place? We have to ask ourselves, what are the sources of wealth? There is no source of wealth in this country that has not been based on extractive labor or extractive practices, right? And what I mean by extractive is actually something I learned from the good folks at Movement Generation. We're talking about extraction from the land, extraction from people, and even extract, extraction from the spirits and the souls of people in the land, right, um, that we inhabit. And so I think it's especially important for us to have a keen understanding of power, how power is shaped, and how power moves. Who has the ability to make decisions? And what has to happen mm -hmm. is that people who have the power need to give it up mm -hmm. or needs to be taken away. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we actually put ourselves in a better position to transform. And it's not about using the master's tools to dismantle the master's house, as Audre Lorde was saying. It's about actually approaching things in a radically different way. Why are we, if Dr. King, you know, lots of people celebrated his life just a couple days ago and, and talked about his assass the assassination and the, the killing. He didn't die, he was killed, right? He didn't just die. And he talked about the kind of house that he was integrating his people into, the burning house that he was integrating his people into. And so I want to spend the next 20 years thinking about how do we completely construct the house in a different way and not just integrating our people into the house as is. Thank and you. when we start to talk about on those, talk in those terms, mm -hmm. then we actually can move towards the world that we want to live in. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. So, yeah. And, and as, you, as you get ready to, to chime on, in on this, mm -hmm. will you also help us think about how, is, how does race play into the future mm. of this vision that's been laid out? Yeah. Well, um, I want to just build off of this. How do we create the house of the future? Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot that we can learn from our domestic workers mm -hmm. about how we do that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I work with the workforce 
that goes to work in our homes every day, caring for our kids as nannies, um, caring for our aging parents as home care workers, supporting our loved ones with disabilities, cleaning as house cleaners. How many of you know somebody who works as a domestic worker? Mm. Let's give them a shout out for the work. Yeah. That they do. And when I say there's a lot that we can learn from this workforce, I really do mean that, in that um, this workforce, when we first started organizing 20-some years ago, was very much seen as on the kind of margins of the economy, in the shadows, where conditions like long hours or not enough hours or unpredictable hours, lack of access to benefits and any kind of safety net, um, no career um, advancement opportunities or job security, right? Those conditions were very much seen as on the edges. And today, those, dis those conditions are coming to define more and more of the American workforce. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so as we start talking about the future of work and we start talking about, uh, uh, about the economy of the future and gig economy, I mean, domestic workers were really the original gig economy workers, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And so what can we learn about how they've organized and how they've been building power against all odds, excluded from every labor protection, to create a sense of dignity in the work that they do? And the thing about it is it's actually bound up in mutuality, where one of the things that domestic workers started realizing is the incredible sense of dependence that the families that they support have on them. And as we look at the demographic shifts with a growing aging population in this country that is gonna need care, it also means that home care workers are the fastest growing occupation in our entire economy. And that by the year 2030, if you take child care jobs and elder care jobs combined, it will be, care jobs will be the largest occupation in our entire workforce. These are jobs that won't be outsourced and they won't be automated, at least anytime soon. And the annual median income of a home care worker is $13,000 per year. Mm. Problem. So the people we're counting on to take care of us actually can't care for themselves or their own families on the wages that they earn. Mm -hmm. And so now in that context, how do we make these jobs good jobs? Mm -hmm. Well, we actually join together with the millions of families, the 100 million people in this country who are actually struggling with getting the care that they need. Mm -hmm. And we actually create a movement a caring majority movement in this country that fights for universal access, to Carmen's point earlier, universal access to child care, mm -hmm. to elder care, to paid family leave, to all the things that we need to take care of our families while we work. And we fight for every single job that's gonna support us to take care of our families, every home care worker, every child care job, every housekeeping job to be a good job for the 21st century that you can take pride in and support your family on. Thank you. That's mutuality. That's the kind of win-win for the 21st century that puts the needs of women of color and excluded workers at the forefront, but actually lifts conditions for the entire country across mm -hmm. generations. Thank you. Najin, as we think about what you just said, how should we think about race? Because in many cases, people are still saying that we shouldn't talk about it as we think about the future. We have to talk about it. I mean, the exclusions of this workforce and the way that we got here to so deeply undervalue this work has everything to do with the legacy of anti-black racism and slavery in this country. So we have to talk about it. And what I think is the real possibility here is that because there are 100 million of us who are directly affected by the need for care, there's actually a very clear shared interest that we have to solve for that challenge so that if 100 million of us can be in motion together, it creates a very different context for a conversation about race and racial equity. How do we solve for this challenge in a way that leaves no person behind? 
how do we solve for, the ch for this challenge in a way that actually addresses histories of exclusion and pain and harm that have been done? And when you have that conversation in the context of moving towards a common solution that actually does benefit everyone, it's a very different context. So I think if we can actually create a holistic vision for this country that addresses the profound pain that we're all feeling around inequality in, in its different dimensions, and use that as a context for saying we actually have to deal with all of these different forms of inequities, especially the major fissures and deep wounds around race mm -hmm. that have shaped our economy so deeply, in order to get to where we all want to go, I think it's a different context for that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. So we spent some time on wisdom, and I would love for us to shift for a moment to talk a little bit about business. I want Lata to share how she's working to create the future of shared value within corporations. I'm going to turn to you, Derek, to help us think about leadership in this context, and then I'm going to really anchor the, the majority of the rest of the conversation on the economy, and I want you all to chime into that. So, Lata, based on what you've heard, can you share how Prudential is hearing this in, in the equity space and how you're leading on it? Yes, absolutely. Good morning, everybody. It's great to be here. Uh, so for us, the edge, right, the frontier of equity is capital markets and the ability to leverage and shift, right, how capital markets are working right now or not working for people of color and low-income people in this country to really drive equity forward. And so it's not sufficient, but it's a necessary part of the equation. We believe that deeply. And it's, Mike, you said it up perfectly, right? To get to your number, we've got to move capital markets. And so we think about that both internally and externally. And you know, internally, it's about the fact that we're a large employer. We've got over 50,000 employees around the world. And we have a responsibility, right, and an opportunity to drive equity for our own workforce. And so we think about it in the forms of an inclusive culture. How do we make sure that when our folks show up for work every day, they feel like they belong, their participation is valued, and they can be successful? And undergirding that, right, are progressive policies and practices. And so, you know, expanded paternity leave, same-sex partner benefits, we banned the box years ago, right? So things like that that we do, again, that speak to inclusion. And that, right, the hope is, and the belief is that that will attract the diverse, talented workforce that we need now and that we'll need certainly going into the future. And so thinking creatively about how we build those pipelines that come into Prudential, but also, as importantly, right, go out into the world and fuel the talent uh, and the workforce of the future. So that's the internal uh, perspective. And then externally, it's all about execution, right? How do we embed this lens of inclusion and this value of inclusion in every decision that we make as a company? And think about our capabilities across the enterprise. We're a global financial services firm, a Fortune 50 company, right? We've got a lot of heft. And so how do we, as a major actor in capital markets, think about that? How do we open up new markets? How do we develop products and services that meet the needs of a broader group of stakeholders that are truly inclusive in our offerings? And so, you know, how do we invite, right, others into this conversation? And, you know, a lot about that, right, about listening and learning. And we're not the experts, and we're part of, you know, part of the problem, right? So how do we solution together? And we've created a platform inside of Prudential that we actually call Inclusive Markets, where we bring external thought partners like Carmen and others to the table with our business executives to think about exactly that, right? How do we solution to solve this problem? How do we leverage the might of a Prudential and other corporations to think differently about how we meet people's needs? And so really exciting things that are in flight right now as a result of those conversations, a better understanding of consumer insights, right? How financially vulnerable people, what their lived experience is that our folks can benefit from and in turn can think creatively about how to solve. Mm -hmm. And Lapa, can you share a little bit more about why, why is Prudential doing this? Because you've weighed, Prudential and your leadership and your team have waded deep into the equity space. And so as we think about the future, what are some of those things, why is that happening? Values, et cetera, that others could think about if they're trying to shape that corporation of the future that's going to do this type of work. Yeah, we think, you know, it's clearly a moral imperative for us and a business imperative. So on the business side, it's, you know, look, we're not stupid. We know if we don't help solve for this, right, we won't exist going forward. So that mutuality, right, comes from that, that our workforce of the future, our customers of the future are going to be of color, right? And so we need to lift people up uh, from our own self-interest around, you know, how we move forward as a business. And on the moral imperative side, right, this is present at our founding. We were founded as a purpose-built, purpose-driven company to include people had, who had been excluded. So. Uh, our story, right, we were founded over 142 years ago to provide insurance to working families 
who at the time couldn't access insurance products because the prevailing belief was that they couldn't afford to pay their premiums or worse, couldn't be trusted to pay their premiums. So our founder thought otherwise and uh, created a business solution to this pressing societal need and that's how we were founded. Thank you. Derek, you've heard a lot this morning. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. What's the leadership that's necessary when we think about the future, especially if you've come into your role at the NAACP, how do leaders need to take up their role differently to be able to, one, lead effectively and then have relevant organizations? For me, growing up in Detroit and living in Mississippi, I've had the advantage of sitting around a lot of civil rights veterans, particularly those who are active during the civil rights movement in Mississippi, who built out the concept of Freedom Summer and was outcome driven. And one of the things I learned from that process, the difference between egocentric leadership versus community-centric leadership. Egocentric leadership always fails us. It's based in a personality, charisma, and when that, that personality is off the scene, people are let down. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that throughout history, but community-centric leadership allow for each individual in the community to see their power and how they can lean in to advance a public policy infrastructure to protect the communities they come from. And so as I measure outcomes over the history, not only the civil rights movement, but the journey of Africans in this country, you can see glimpse of opportunities through an intergenerational model that's community-centric, and that's when we advance more opportunity than ever before. I love the legacy of Dr. King. He was a big voice, he was inspired. But last week's celebration was about the sanitation workers mm -hmm. who actually had the courage to take up the fight for their dignity. I am a man, I am a human who invited King in to speak on their behalf. Mm -hmm. That's community-centric leadership and, and unfortunately because of his assassination, many people mourn, but those sanitation workers continue to fight and they won that war. But the fight continues and we see that time in and time out. So the future of leadership must be based on the needs of the community as defined by the community and led by the community and not social justice celebrities. While we're on the thread of Dr. King and the thread of charismatic leadership, Ella Baker, who uh, taught so many of us about group-centered leadership, mm -hmm. and we saw that embody in the NAACP as she built it out uh, in ex tremendous ways, and also in the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, is that Martin didn't make the movement, the movement made Martin. Mm -hmm. So when we want to talk about leadership development, Dr. King, I agree with you, Derek, right? It was about the sanitation workers. I believe that if he, uh, when we're thinking about his legacy and the work that's happening today, I think about the young folks in BYP 100, the young people in Asada's Daughters who are high school students, mm -hmm. middle school students, the young people who walked out of their schools across the country. And I think about leadership that makes other people uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. It makes, Ella Baker made people uncomfortable. SNCC, the leaders in that organization made people uncomfortable, mm -hmm. and many of the young people today doing the work make people uncomfortable. And if you don't leave with anything else, know that our movement is too intergenerational. Mm -hmm. Dr. Barbara Ransby was around here yesterday, and she may be here today. Every step of the way of building BYP 100, she and other elders have been a part of that process. Mm -hmm. Um, OGs have been a part of, of, uh, have been my, the people who I have consulted, mm -hmm. the people who I have leaned on, and it's, it's a, it's a misunderstanding, I think, and it's a, it's a missed opportunity in how we think about the work today. Because there's a deep sense of clarity. If you go to any action, be it the action we have for DeCynthia Clements just a couple days ago. She's a black woman who was killed a month ago by Elgin police officers. Mm -hmm. Very few people said her name across the country, mm -hmm. right? Her name was quite drowned out, even though she was killed just a month ago. Mm -hmm. um, you heard the names and the legacies. People discuss where we've come from the people who fought this, fought this fight before we got here um, and where we're going. And when we talk about the future, our movement and our work must be grounded in the people who come before us, for better or for worse. One, to learn and to build on the things that they, done, they did amazingly, and to also work on not just the perfection, but actually doing the work in bigger ways and uh, in the ways, in differently ways, right, so we can have different results. And so 
that's really important for me when we talk about leadership development. No person should all, and I'm so happy that Angela is wise enough, right, mm -hmm. to shepherd in new leadership, mm -hmm. because everybody doesn't do that. That's right. We have plenty of organizations where leaders refuse to leave. Mm -hmm. They refuse to leave. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be about the business of transformation, we have to be about the business of investing in young people. And mm -hmm. that's what we believe in and do in our work every day. Perfect. So, um, so on this point, before we go to the economy, you, so we've got one, one capability, which is the consciousness that leaders bring to being able to be community-centered. As you both do your work, Charlene and Derek, are you seeing other capabilities that need to um, be at the forefront of an organization that's going to be effective in the future? And the rest of you all chime in as well. For me, it must be outcome-driven, not process-driven, okay. not seeking the next demonstration or the next march. Mm -hmm. That feels good, but when it's over, have you materially changed or impacted the lives that you was demonstrating for? Mm -hmm. If you have not done that, you've just wasted a lot of people time, unfortunately, for them because they are investing their time, their energy, mm -hmm. and much of them, many of them don't have much time. Mm -hmm. People who hit the streets oftentimes are those who work every day. That's right. Mm -hmm. Young people who are hitting the streets, they are looking for inspiration, something new to do. I recall in 1994, I was just finishing Tougaloo College, and there was a group of us who had been protesting for two years to prevent the closing and merging mm -hmm. of publicly funded schools in Mississippi, which would, ha would have had an impact on HBCUs across the country. And the, and the Freedom Summer volunteers came in on campus to celebrate the 40th anniversary. And you have several of them say, well, young people don't do X, and young people haven't done this, and young people haven't done that. So we took the stage, and we educated them on what we had just gone through over the past two years. Mm -hmm. Many of them simply didn't know. And what happens over time, the breakdown of communications between the gen generations, or individuals who had that episode and moment for that march, <laughs> They forever thinking about that march 40, 50 years ago and not realizing as a result of that march in Selma, Alabama, the same mayor remained in office from 1965 to 2000 in the 70% African-American city, and the conditions of those people in Selma did not change. Mm -hmm. Was that a victory? Or was it the victory, the county next door, where some of those same people who left Mississippi, went to Alabama, stopped in Selma, said, we're not doing this anymore, and went to Lyons County and, and, and organized the Black Panther Party and took over the county. So now those, that community was self-determined. Mm -hmm. That's the victory. We don't celebrate Lowndes County, but we oftentimes talk about Selma. Selma, there are some good things. It brought international press. John Lewis was courageous. But in Lowndes County, the people are still living off the legacy of the victory from 1966, and they still are self-determined. Mm -hmm. That's where the victories lie. In Jackson, Mississippi, when a group of young white kids ran over a brother and, it was, and was captured on tape, and all nine of them are sitting in jail today. Why? Because you had an African-American mayor, African-American police chief, an African-American DA, an African-American federal judge, an African-American bailiff, an African-American uh, over the war, an African-American U.S. marshal. So every stop in the, in the judicial system, they look, they look at brothers and say, you're going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> now, in Jackson, Mississippi, that didn't happen overnight. Yeah. That happened because of struggle over time where people held systems accountable and understood that democracy are for those who participate mm -hmm. and we were going to take our participation level at a place that the individuals who sat in the offices were going to look like those who you're going to represent. In all eight years of Obama's administration, Mississippi is the only state where every federal appointment was African American mm -hmm. because 20 years prior and leading up there was ongoing advocacy. There was no big speech, no demonstration, but there was an acknowledgement that power comes before policy. Because if you talk about policy without power, it's just an academic, uh, academic exercise. But in a democracy, we have to collectively leverage our vote to get the power so we can change the policy infrastructure. Thank you. So, um, so I'm really happy you asked this question. So I meant to say welcome to Chicago when I began. <laughs> welcome to Chicago. I was born and raised here. And uh, this is uh, the primary site of the, 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 the struggle and the movement work that I'm involved in and committed to. This is also a city where nearly 40% of our public service budget goes to the Chicago Police Department. Right? Nearly 40%. And BYP 100 joined Law for Black Lives and the Center for Popular Democracy to uh, produce the Freedom to Thrive report 
that looks at 12 areas across the country and the policing budgets and then the budgets for other various social services and infrastructure, right? Um, up the street of Detroit, it's just over 30%. Uh, someone could correct me if I have that, that percentage wrong. Just over 30%. In Oakland, the number is astronomical. In New York City, the number is, is, is bananas, right? And so the competencies, how do we actually address that? One, what we call for a divestment from sis carceral systems, be it policing, prisons, jails, um, various systems, various carceral systems, and an investment in our communities. And what that could look like for core competencies in our movements is following the work of the good folks out in the Bay Area, the anti-police terror um, group led by Cap Brooks, who may be in the, um, the room today, uh, and other organizations, the Audrey Lohr Project, and building up our competencies to address conflict, harm, and violence in radically different ways. So having community response teams. When someone like Deborah Dana or DeCynthia Clements or um, the young man in, in, in Brooklyn who was just killed, shot and killed by NYPD, are in the, mental of, in the middle of a mental health crisis, who should respond? Not the police. Yeah. And so what if we built movements? We built movements that actually met the needs right, of the conflicts that happen in our homes, in our communities every single day. That is a basic competency that if those things were invested in, and again, there are organizations that have been doing that work. We don't need any foundation in this room or large organization in this room to go out and do it on their own. <laughs> Invest in the groups that are actually doing that work. And if we, it, right? So if we were to put our time and our energy and work like that, that would immediately change the material conditions of our people, right? So not just simply having, uh, we can't just have, what we don't have right now, I live on the south side of Chicago. If something happens in my neighborhood, I'll tell you a very, very quick story. I was driving home uh, down 47th Street with two uh, comrades in BYP 100. I live around the corner from the train station. Um, we're driving and we see a young, a black person, I actually don't know the age of the person, lying on the ground. They've been, just been shot. And um, so we park my car and we walk back around. And there's this older black man who could be my, uh, my uncle standing there. Every day there are at least two police cars stationed at this exact spot. And he says to me, he leans over and he says, they're only here to protect the businesses. They don't care about us. And in one sentence he explained to me racial capitalism. The understanding that the economy, the way the economies operate in the United States of America and around the world, are a racialized capitalism, right? Impacted and built around structural racism, built around and founded on anti-black racism. And that we could use all these fancy words, but he summed it up in one sentence. Mm -hmm. And it tells me that our people understand that's what's at stake, and that actually we should be investing our dollars in things that create real safety, not things that extract and actually don't keep us safe. And so that's what I want to see, building up competencies within our organizations, within our communities, to deal with conflict and harm in radically different ways, mental health care, right, conflict resolution, good jobs, quality public schools, and quality comprehensive health care. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. All right. so we're we're going to shift to the economy. Ajin, I would love for you to, we talk about the inclusive economies being the future. Mm -hmm. I would love for you to help us understand what would be the components of an inclusive economy. And then tell, I would love for you to help me understand what does that mean for Native communities? Is it different, or do we need to bring in more wisdom into what we've defined as inclusive economy? Okay. And I'm coming to you, Carmen. Excuse me. Well, I think uh, it starts with an economy where the wealth that working people produce, they actually benefit from. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, yes. And that, um, that everyone who's working incredibly hard in our economy can actually take care of their families and pay the bills and live with dignity and security. Um, it also means that um, people have the opportunity to realize their potential in the world. And they're supported to do that um, and have access to the things that they need in order to explore what that is, whether it's educational opportunity or it's childcare or it's actually a public transportation infrastructure that works, mm -hmm. right? These are things that are about um, infrastructure to support our participation in an inclusive economy such that it can be truly inclusive. And one thing I will say is we do have to expand, I think, in the 21st century what we mean by infrastructure. 
we're used to thinking about it as transportation systems and the kind of channels that allow for commerce in a kind of 1950s economy. And what we need to be doing is thinking about in the 21st century, what are all the things that will actually support maximum human um, productivity, but in a way that is about realizing human potential and valuing the contributions that everyone is making to our economy and our society. And I think care is a vital part of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. right? What could be more important than our ability to make sure that our parents are safe and well cared for and can live with dignity, our children are cared for, right? These are things that are inherent to a functioning economy that we have just never valued, protected, or designed for. Perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah, what did you hear? <laughs> So when it comes to indigenous communities, uh, the economy is a vastly different conversation. Um, you know, Native nations are sovereign places. We are sovereign nations that are within the nation. Um, you know, oftentimes I hear this, oh, well, we gave you that land. I'm like, no, that's actually not how things <laughs> work. <laughs> we were here and we gave you that. Um, I think you know, a good starting point would be looking at your congresspersons and actually asking them, are you upholding treaty obligations? You know, you get this conversation again and again of, oh, well, that was so long ago. You know, the US Constitution was quite a while ago, too. <laughs> but free speech issues are in the news every other day, and we're talking about the Second Amendment now. I mean, we're having that conversation, right, about all kinds of different things surrounding the Second Amendment and how that's interpreted. But, you know, treaties are the supreme law of the land, and so, you look at, okay, well, part of these obligations are healthcare, education, basic structure, you know, basic governance structure. We are radically, radically failing as a country. If this is the United States, that is not happening in Indian country. Um, it is a desperate situation of, you know, underfunding and hospitals that are falling apart, education systems that are just subpar in almost every way. Um, you know, a, a side note, I remember a story where a BIE, it's called the Bureau of Indian Education, they were trying to do trainings about, you know, like the, the school shootings, what do we do? And so they had the FBI come in, and the FBI came in and said, we're not actually going to even do this training because this school needs to be condemned. It's not safe for students to be here. Cool. That's the situation of education at, that was guaranteed by the federal government. But you go to look at, you know, the military schools, they're in great condition. That should not be like that in this country. Um, you know, it, I keep coming back to this truth narrative of teaching and understanding what actually happened. You know, why are you guys so poor? Why is that still the situation? And I'm like, okay, there's only two states in this country that even acknowledge the boarding school era, that even acknowledge that my grandmother and her brothers and sisters were forced out of, out of their home and sent to a school to have their language and culture beaten out of them. You don't get past that in a generation. You don't get past that in two generations. Those traumas still exist. We don't even acknowledge that in this country. There is no truth and reconciliation in the United States of America. They're trying in Canada. They've at least made some strides forward. But you, know, you still have dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of First Nations who are under boiled water advisories who don't even have the basics of human survival. So I think there's, you know, the economics need to start like foundationally with those basics. Um, but then you know, I think there's a lot we can do with Organizations with, through nonprofits and through empowering communities. I think a big part of empowering our communities locally is our is our power and our energy decisions, right? So it's it's always so fascinating to me that I go and sit and talk with these people who are well. We kind of need pipelines and we need oil and we need this because our our economy is based in this entrenched entrenched industry. You know, it's solar. Yeah, okay, that's that's great, but I don't really know that it can meet our solutions. We're going out and doing small-scale solar in indigenous communities and providing long-term jobs. Mm -hmm. You know, tiny little operations of we've converted this old barn on the White Earth Reservation into a solar manufacturing facility and provided long-term jobs. If we can do it, anyone can do it. You know, we can make energy sovereignty for our communities mm -hmm. and make these decisions for ourselves. We can pass ordinances and resolutions and laws that don't allow extractive industry to continue their you know, grabbing of our remaining resources. Mm -hmm. Tell me, I should this question. Do you think that until we do right by native peoples, do you think that we can get where we're going when we talk about an inclusive economy? Absolutely not. You know, I think it's, it's kind of like the canary in the mine, right? 
How do you treat your most at-risk communities? How do you treat your most vulnerable? That is how we are all, we should all be treated, right? We should all be having the same conversation of, it's not okay. There is no such thing as a sacrifice zone in this country. There is no such thing as a sacrifice zone in the world. We shouldn't be looking at, okay, well, climate change, oh, that's, you know, it's so far away. No, it's happening. Mm -hmm. It's happening in this country. The first climate change refugees are an indigenous people in, in Louisiana. Their, their homelands are underwater. They've been forced to move back. Mm -hmm. It's looking at the Alaska Native communities and understanding that they are under a 20-year plan, figuring out how they're going to have to move off of their lands they've had since time immemorial because it's going to be underwater from, from rising seas. Mm -hmm. you know, we cannot move forward inclusively unless we are all moving forward together. And that means including indigenous peoples and also recognizing, just for basics of humanity, 80% of the world's remaining biodiversity is in indigenous hands. That is all of us that is at stake. We have not lost our connection to the land and the water. We understand how serious the situation is. And right now, extractive industry is coming for the last of that. So we have to stand together and move forward. Perfect. Carmen, I'm going to turn to you. Thank you. And, and then Lotha and Rip, I would like for you all to talk a little bit about what you've been doing to help innovate in an inclusive economy. But Carmen, can you talk about how you, we've heard about power a lot on the stage today, how we can think about power in the context of worker power? and as well as how do we should think about technology as we think about this inclusive economy. Yeah, so at the Workers Lab, one of the things that I really love about our work is that we were seeded by SEIU and the labor movement to take some key features of the 20th century labor movement and figure out how to seed them into sort of the, the new cutting edge of what an economy could look like for people of color and working people in this country. And so what we did was say, um, what are the things that have made the labor movement really successful to this point? And one was the ability to scale collective bargaining. So it didn't matter if you were a bus driver in Oakland, a seamstress in New York, whether you worked as a, an electrician in Texas, collective bargaining was able to scale as a model to build power. So that's one of the key things that we look for. The other thing is that we look for sustainability or the ability, ability to generate independent revenue so the dues model was a way for labor unions to amass a, a set of resources that were neither fig, finicky nor contingent. They didn't have to go, they had their members, right? In order to respond to the needs of working people, working people paid dues, and it created room for the labor movement to have um, a voice and set a table and contest for power uh, in this country. The third was an unabashed focus on building power for working people. Mm -hmm. Um, and so for us, the things that are really exciting at this mo moment are those opportunities that we see to um, essentially things that live at the center of that Venn diagram. And so um, we just made a big announcement earlier this week of our first round of innovation fund grants twice a year. We put out money. Um, we give teams of people $150,000 to try to find new ways to build power for working people. And it was amazing. We've got 350 applicants from all around the world. Um, our three winners, I think most of them are actually here in the room. Uh, one of them is uh, the Hood Incubator in Oakland, uh, Cannabis Inc. Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the cannabis industry is really important and something that I, I don't believe that we as a sector have an orientation around and really want to support black leaders mm -hmm. to imagine what it looks like to have a sovereign cannabis industry mm -hmm. in Colorado in the first two years of, the cannab of cannabis uh, becoming legal. 18,000 new jobs were creating and $2 billion were brought into the state. Mm -hmm. The state of California recently legalized cannabis. I don't think we have language around that. So for us as an organization, we see this as a real opportunity to be at the front edge of finding that. We also uh, made a commitment to two organizations that are looking at cooperative development. Mm -hmm. So ways, new ways to build worker power. We think that worker ownership is worker power. And so in Thunder Valley, uh, in partnership with the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation, we're helping them set up a construction cooperative where they have a main employer that is the Thunder Valley Community Development Corporation. 
where they're building housing, where there's a huge housing shortage, right? So in this, on the, on the, in the vein of sovereignty, um, this is one of those ways. The other uh, cooperative is in Jackson, Mississippi, with Cooperation Jackson. They're building a fabrication lab where they're get to, getting to like build things mm -hmm. and sell things to their community. So for us, what we're trying to do is figure out what are, like the DNA of the 20th century labor movement, what, what was necessary for them to win, and what is necessary for us to seed. When it comes to technology, so when I started the Workers Lab, one of the things that uh, I thought, uh, one of my hypotheses that is, since I feel like I um, uh, carry around like a cross on top of me, was that technology was a, an important force to build power. And more and more, I have come to learn and hold um, that technology is a means. This is to your point about like the place that we want to go. And I've been thinking in the context of the congressional hearings and Mark Zuckerberg, that we actually don't have a really good relationship with technology, <laughs> that we have ceded power. We had the people who represent us ha asking Mark Zuckerberg whether or not he wanted to be regulated. Yes. That's crazy. Yes. <laughs> and we all interact with technology in that way. We seek acceptance of technology. We seek um, support from tech leaders. There's a way in which, because they've solved a minuscule problem in Ooh. our world of connectivity, we have surrendered the ability to solve the more complex problems in our world. Mm. And it's not true. Right. Could I jump in on that quickly? Not only is technology a potential problem for communities of colors, if you look at the current education landscape, we're not preparing kids to engage. Mm -hmm. We have starved the systems. We have criticized the systems for not performing, going to your point on, on the Native Reservation. So we don't give them resources. We, we criticize them for not performing. We demonize those who speak out against it. Then we privatize it. Yeah. 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 That's right. And we're, we're talking about what the future is going to look like. We are underdeveloping our young people at a rate faster than we have ever seen before during a period of time where technology is excelling at a rate that we've never seen before. We are creating a future that would disempower us and government won't have anything to do with it. Mm -hmm. right. I also think that there's a way in which we've talked about or like situated the future of work and technology mm -hmm. wholly disconnected from the present and the past of work, right? Mm -hmm. So Charlene made this really important point, right? Like the, of, of extraction. Mm -hmm. And we have a history of human extraction and environmental extraction, spiritual extraction, and that is something that we have an opportunity now to shift. Mm -hmm. And I think that if we start to talk about the future uh, unencumbered, untethered from the present and the past, then I can't but believe that we're not going to be having this same conversation in 20 years and refuse to have it. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. I feel like we're just getting started and I've gotten the five minute. <laughs> Mark, so what I would like to do is rip, I would like to ask you and Latha to share a little bit about your partnership and provide us some wisdom about what you think is most important for us to think about from the, fu about the future from where you sit in your roles and then I'm gonna let you bring it home, Charlene. Oh, okay. All right? <laughs> I don't know. No one, Charlene, is following me. I got to be careful. <laughs> uh, let me just quickly back into the conversation. Yes. And, and it, it seems narrow, but actually, I think it, it ends up being profound. Because I think Lada said earlier how capital moves, whether we like it or not, is just is a make or break deal, right? And so if I'm sitting as a philanthropy, I have three different ways to sort of think about how to move capital. I can move my own capital, and I think defensively, I think we've done a good job. Early childhood education, community organizing, community infrastructure, environmental protection. Um, the second, though, is to get other people, private capital, to move its capital differently. And boy, that's really hard. Mm -hmm. But philanthropy can actually step into that role to some extent. We can de-risk transactions. We can um, sort of layer on capital to make other things happen. And Detroit is just replete with examples where the mm -hmm. private sector just wanted nothing to do with investing into Detroit. And we just had to kind of show that you could and that you could actually create market level responses to some of these really fundamental issues. But the third, and I think where the where the panel has gone mostly, I think is probably over the long term is the most important, is that how do you put capital in the hands of the folks closest to the ground who know how to use it? 
Mm -hmm. And I think that there are a lot of ways to, to do that. Some are old fashioned, mm -hmm. but some are really important. I mean, community development finance institutions out of the community, of the community, can move money into the community in ways that Citibank mm -hmm. um, and even Prudential probably can't do. But mm -hmm. I, I, all, I think that, that, in that in that sense, philanthropy is sort of this interesting bridging mechanism. And I get that it's, that it's built on all sorts of layers of privilege and remove. But at the other hand, it is, it is a bridge. That's right. We can have this conversation with pi private capital providers, because we, we're capital mm -hmm. providers, right? And if we get smarter about our capital provision, they get smarter about their capital provision, I think it's inevitable that, that we help the community get a lot smarter about their capital provision. Thank you. Yeah, so very similar philosophy, which is what led to uh, our partnership, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you know, for us in Prudential, access to capital is key. We're an asset owner. We think very carefully about how we deploy our capital, right? how we invest with purpose and for purpose. And so that's about putting capital in the hands of people, right? people who are going to make the difference and invest in their own communities. So uh, really pleased to uh, talk about the partnership that we've created with the Kresge Foundation and the Annie A. Casey Foundation. And, the three of us came together to do just that, to address the capital gap, right? We've all seen the woeful statistics around the amount of capital that flows to women of color and to people uh, of color and communities of color. And so trying to rectify that by uh, putting more money out into the street. And as Rip said, right, it's a leveraging uh, effect. And so we've come in with $100 million in new investment capital that will go directly into communities of color with 30 million in guarantees from the foundations. And what those guarantees will do is cover any potential losses from defaults right, on those loans. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, open up our aperture right, for our tolerance for risk. And so it allows us to take more risk, which means we can invest in more things right, and more opportunities that, again, have a much higher upside in terms of really moving the needle for impacts on people of color. Thank you. Thank you. So we've got a bright future. I believe so. <laughs> We're winning on equity. Mm. It's 50 years. Mm -hmm. One. Mm -hmm. What you got? Oh, in 50 years, what do I have? Well, like any historian or aspiring historian, I'm going to go to history and lift up the legacy of Winnie Mandela, who uh, recently passed away and who held down the African National Congress in the, uh, the fight to end apartheid in South Africa while Mandela was in prison and other freedom fighters were in prison. And the reason why I bring her up is because we have to think about and talk about South Africa in this particular moment, where we are having conversations about political power and economic power, power in the same note. And what does it mean for a country, for black people, to actually be in solid political power and hold very little economic power, right? And where there's, a solid, there's amazing work happening in South Africa right now to think, how do we actually build our country where we've, we've, we've Maintain we've held political power, but our system is still built on a system of capitalism that is extracted from the people, from the workers, be they miners, educators, healthcare workers. So how can we think deeper? That's, that's, we have to think deeper and think bigger. In, this, in 50 years, I think capitalism as it is now is not just on wobbly feet, mm -hmm. but it's on its way out. Yeah. And we have a different, we have a different system. If we've won, winning doesn't mean that capitalism exists. Two other things is that we refuse to tell a single story about what we've been through and what we want and who we are. Because when we tell incomplete stories about who we are and where we've been, we will have incomplete solutions. And then three, just going back to thinking big and going deep. It is not a risk to invest in black and brown and indigenous people fighting for liberation. That is your surest bet. Your surest bet. Because when we actually have the resources, be it human resources, financial resources, environmental resources, to lead our own struggles, to lead our own battles, the world is transformed. The world is transformed. And so it is not a risk to invest in us. It's a risk to invest in the same old, same old, that get the same result. And so invest in grassroots organizing, invest in cooperative workers' collectives, invest in that type of work, and we'll actually get the kind of results we want. A caring economy, too, because Aiden is up here, just to be clear. <laughs> a caring economy, and we'll get the type of world we want in 50 years. That's what it looks like. Wow. Yeah. Please join me. Thank you all.